It's good to be with you again on this beautiful Lord's Day. Please have your Bibles open to John chapter 1. We'll begin there in just a moment. John chapter 1. We live in such a politically correct world. For a world that espouses free speech, sometimes we don't act like it very much. I think our culture, more accurately, espouses politically correct speech, or at least that's what they seem to honor and hold up as reputable. Everyone is trying to offend the least amount of people for ratings sake. And I suppose if you're in the TV business, I don't have a problem with that. I'm a businessman. I, I get it. As long as you're not deceiving people, as long as you're not lying, getting people to believe something that is false, doing something for ratings, okay, I, I, I get that. Where I have a problem with political correctness is when it gets into the religious realm. Like, that's a ratings business. But that doesn't even bother me as much because most religion is a business. What bothers me even most of all is when political correctness gets into the Lord's church. Where we start making decisions about church practice and we start making decisions about what we teach in Bible class or what we preach from the pulpit or what we say to this member or that member. We start compromising the truth based on what doesn't offend, what's politically correct, not stepping on people's toes because we just don't want to hurt their feelings. This lesson really came to a head as I was having a discussion last Sunday with some brethren here about a movement in the Churches of Christ to take the sign, Church of Christ, off of the building, off of the sign out front, and put something else there. Now, I, I want to say something very clearly. I am not a traditionalist. I have no traditional tie to the name Church of Christ. And if you're wondering why we call ourselves that, it's because we find that name in the Bible, in the New Testament. But if you're going to change the name Church of Christ from a local calling that uh, a local congregation to something else, as long as it's something scriptural, there's no degrees of scripturalness. Either it's scriptural, either you find it in the New Testament, or you don't, period. But we were talking about some case in point that somebody knew of where they were, t they were thinking of at least taking the name Church of Christ off of the building because Church of Christ is viewed as offensive. And I think I would take issue with that in and of itself. Uh, but then again, I'm a millennial. I think millennials don't know anything about the Church of Christ. So I suppose it's what generation you're thinking of and, and whether that's offensive or not. But that's what I'm talking about. And the name that they wanted to go to or were thinking about going to was not scriptural. Now again, if you're going from one scriptural name to another scriptural name, there's not degrees of scripturalness. But if you're going to compromise what the New Testament says about local congregations because of what's offensive, because of what's politically correct, now I've got a problem with that. This lesson isn't about names on congregations and names on signs. Again, I have no traditional tie to any name as long as it's in the New Testament. What this lesson is about is can we live for Christ? Can we be disciples of Christ and be politically correct? And the point that I want to make this evening is that that's impossible. We serve the rock of offense. That's one of the names of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we talk about a lot of the positive, uplifting names of Christ. Savior, Redeemer, Friend. But we don't talk about this name very much because it doesn't bring to light as, 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 as a positive nature as those other terms. But this is a name of Christ. And Christ will always be offensive in any culture because of what He came to do. Look in your Bibles here at John chapter 1. Begin with me in verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines where? In the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus Christ came to bring spiritual light where there was spiritual darkness. To tell us how spiritually undone and doomed we are without Him. But in this culture especially, 
if you really want to get under somebody's fingernails, tell them that they're wrong. I don't know how you school teachers do it. I come from the retail world where the customer's always right, so I don't tell anybody that they're wrong at all. But to tell people that they're wrong, that's offensive, and people have a problem with that. But that's one of the duties of Christ, to show us the mess that we are in spiritually. Jump over to chapter 3, the conversation with Nicodemus. And Jesus will say that what happened, what his purpose in John chapter 1, is the exact reason why people don't want to come to him. Because they will have light shine down in their dark lives. Look at verse 19 of chapter 3. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light, rather than Jesus. If I could paraphrase, why did people love sin rather than Jesus? The last part of verse 19, because their works were evil. Verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates Jesus. Again, I'm paraphrasing, hates the light and does not come to Jesus. Again, I'm paraphrasing. They don't come to the light, lest what? Lest their works should be exposed. Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel will always be offensive because it shines light on our dark, doomed lives of sin. But where does this where does, the, where does the Bible call Jesus the rock of offense? That is first introduced in the scripture in Isaiah chapter 8. Turn with me there to Isaiah chapter 8. This is the only time this term rock of offense is used in the Old Testament. And then twice we are, we are told this, this phrase in the New Testament. It always has reference to Jesus. But I want you to begin reading with me in verse 12. Isaiah is talking about the northern tribes and how they are completely doomed. And how Assyria is going to take them away into captivity. The northern ten tribes. Well, a lot of times in the Old Testament prophets, where there's a doom and gloom prophecy, oftentimes that's where they'll give a glimmer of light about the coming Christ. And that's what Isaiah gives. Except there's kind of one bummer. Not everything about the Christ is going to be positive. Beginning here in verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 8, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. If there's one thing that could be said about any ungodly society, it's this. Don't listen to that society. Don't call conspiracy what they do. Don't fear what they fear. But what should you do? Honor the Lord. Fear the Lord. Let him be your dread. And now note verse 14. He will be a sanctuary and a stone of offense, and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many shall stumble on it, verse 15. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. When we talk about the rock of offense or offending somebody or Jesus Christ being offensive, we're not necessarily talking about Jesus hurting people's feelings, although that could be an aspect of it. When the Bible uses this term, rock of offense, it's talking about something that you stumble over. It's actually used, metaphorically, of the trigger on a trap. A trigger on a trap, or a bait stick. You know how you stick bait on the end of a hook? And what's the hook? What do people get hooked on? Jesus Christ. He's the problem. Put that in quotes. And I love this snare idea, this trap idea, because he uses this in the, in the latter part of verse 14. A trap and a snare. Well, who was the trigger on that? Jesus Christ. Before we leave this passage, did you notice that Jesus is going to be both a sanctuary and a rock of offense? That's what verse 14 says at the beginning. He will become a sanctuary, a place of rest, a place of respite. A place of safety. Well, how could Jesus be both a place of safety and the rock of offense? To the believer, one. To the disbeliever, an unbeliever, another. And it's always been like that, right? What did Paul say in Romans chapter 11? Behold the kindness and the severity of God. To you, kindness. But to those that fall, severity. He's always been a sanctuary and a rock of offense. But did you notice in verse 15, he says, Many will stumble over Jesus, the stumbling stone. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 2. When Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple, 
They meet a prophet. He's not called a prophet in Luke chapter 2, but he's called a righteous and devout man. And it says that the Holy Spirit is on this man, Simeon. And he says something to Mary about what Jesus will do. Look at verse 34 of Luke chapter 2. As they bring baby Jesus into the temple, this is Simeon. And Simeon blessed them, said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising. Well, how could you be both? Same way that Jesus is both a sanctuary and the rock of the fence. He is appointed for the fall and the rising of many. But that's Jesus. So getting back to Isaiah, I want you to turn in your Bibles now to Isaiah 28. But before we read that passage, you see where I'm going with this. If we are disciples of Jesus, if we teach what Jesus taught, and He's the rock of offense, people stumble over Jesus... How is it possible that we maintain political correctness in this world? Is that that possible? And the answer is no. Jesus said this about himself and his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 25. He said, if they call the master of the house Beelzebul, what do you think they're going to do? Or how do you think they're going to malign the servants of the house? And I know that's talking about persecution and name calling and, and whatnot. But just take that principle. If they are bold enough to call the master of the house something, don't you think they're going to treat the servants the same way? And if people are offended at Jesus, who loves them the most, if people are offended at Jesus, who is not a hypocrite, and sometimes I am, then is it possible for me to maintain political correctness? No way. But Jesus is not just the rock of offense. He's the... Cornerstone, And that's why I have you here in in Isaiah chapter 28. And you might be wondering, well, why are we talking about Jesus being the cornerstone if the lesson is about him being the rock of offense? The two New Testament passages that mention the rock of offense, they will both bring to our mind this passage about Jesus being the cornerstone. Look at verse 16. Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. And whoever believes in him, most translations say, will not be disappointed or put to shame. So again, Jesus, just like Isaiah chapter 8, he is either going to be your cornerstone, your sanctuary, or you're going to be offended at him. But listen to that text, the cornerstone. Most of the time, we have in the back of our minds, Psalm 118, verse 22, about the cornerstone where that prophecy says that the stone that the builders rejected, this has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. So God was going to lay in Zion a stone, but not just any kind. He was going to be rejected by the Jews, the builders, the original builders. And that was going to become the cornerstone. So the the rejection of Jesus, I know it's kind of sad to read about, but that shouldn't be a, a, a falling point or a tripping point for anybody. That was prophesied about. Go with me now to Romans chapter 9. And here are the two instances where the rock of offense is used. Romans chapter 9 is is the first one. And we're going to transition into talking about now, why do people stumble over Jesus? Why is Jesus offensive anyway? And we'll just take the two reasons that are given in the passages that use this term. First one is this. People stumble over Jesus because they are pursuing works-based righteousness. Now that will be said about the Jews here in Romans chapter 9, but I want to prove to you that a lot of Americans, a lot of religious Americans, are pursuing works-based righteousness. Begin in verse 30 of Romans chapter 9. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. And now underline this phrase. But as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. By the way, that quotation from the Old Testament, it's not a quotation from Isaiah 8 or Isaiah 28. It's both. 
You know, a lot of times the New Testament writers, if you look up their quotation in the Old Testament, you scratch your head and you say, that's not what, that's not what was said. A lot of times they'll take a bit here and a bit here and they'll quote it as one passage. Behold, I am laying in Zion. That comes from Isaiah 28. And then the term stone of stumbling and rock of offense are from Isaiah 8. And then he goes back to Isaiah 28 when he talks about whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. But let's talk about why they stumbled over the stumbling stone. They pursued righteousness as if it were based on works, like they could work hard enough, like they could earn salvation. Did you hear what Ryan said this morning when he was talking about appeasement, propitiation? That God cannot be appeased by what you do, by the amount of obedience that you could give him. God is only appeased by the sacrifice that is in Jesus Christ. And that's the point. Can you earn salvation? Can you do enough good works? Can you visit the sick enough? Can you build houses in Guatemala for the needy and feed enough homeless people? Could you do enough good works to earn your salvation? And the answer is no. But the Jews pursued it like that. And I'm here to tell you, brethren, a lot of Americans are doing the exact same thing. If you ask the average religious American why they believe that they're going to heaven or why they believe they are spiritually okay, you'll get an answer something like this. Well, I, I'm a pretty moral person. I don't cheat on my spouse. I'm a pretty good parent. I take them on time to soccer practice and they get good grades and, and I'm not a drug dealer and I treat women okay. And what they're saying is, I am moral enough. That is works-based, brethren. And that idea creeps into the church. When we talk about somebody's righteousness or somebody's salvation based on their lifelong deeds, well, wait just a minute. Why are you righteous? Why are you confident in your salvation? Because of what Christ did? And you having faith and trust in His promise? Or because your lifelong deeds? And if you don't think that's offensive, just tell it to somebody who's a good moral person. You can put that in quotes. Just tell it to them. And they'll show you how offensive it is. And I'm telling you, those people are the hardest people to convert. But show me somebody who is downcast. Who's lived a rough life. Down and out. And they realize that they need something other than what they're doing to be saved. Now that's a prospect. But people who think they've got their lives put together... I'm telling you, what they're doing is they're pursuing works-based righteousness, whether they have the law of Moses or not. And that's a stumbling stone for a lot of people. The gospel of grace, because what grace implies is that you're a sinner and that you're doomed to hellfire and sin until you accept the gospel of grace, that is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles, please, to... 1 Peter chapter 2. Why do people stumble? Because they don't want to submit their will. They just don't want to obey. You probably have heard uh, in talking with atheists or just reading arguments against atheists that one of the problems with atheists is that if they accept that there is a creator, they are automatically subject to that creator. And they just don't want to have that idea even come to their mind. They, they struggle with the idea of obeying somebody other than themselves. And, and an atheist would laugh at that. But you know, what I would say to the atheist is, if that doesn't bother you, if it doesn't bother you to subject your will to a creator, why are you fighting so hard? I mean, there's not a heaven or a hell. Why are you fighting so hard? Leave us alone. Get out of here. Get out of our schools. Get out of our textbooks. If you don't care about submitting your will to a creator, why are you fighting so hard? But what the Bible will say is that's a stumbling stone for people. That they just don't want to obey a will other than their own. Begin reading with me in verse 4, 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. Now this is Isaiah 28, verse 16. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, 
and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's Psalm 118. Now here's Isaiah 8 and verse 8. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And then Peter breaks it down as if you don't know what he's saying already. He says in the latter part of verse 8, they stumble. Why? Because they disobey. Again, a, an atheist might laugh at that or, or somebody caught up in a false religion that says, that I, just don't, I don't have a problem with Jesus. Well, if you didn't have a problem with him, or if you didn't have a problem subjecting your will to the creator of the universe, then why are you fighting so hard? And this is never made more plain, I think, than in a parable, the parable of the tenants. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 21. We'll kind of wrap up the lesson here with Matthew chapter 21. That one of the reasons that people stumble over the stumbling stone that is Jesus is because they don't want to obey. We'll just paraphrase the parable here in Matthew chapter 21, but I want you to notice something at the end of the parable, and this is unique to Matthew. It's not in Mark or Luke, but the parable of the tenants. So the master of the house, he has a vineyard, and he rents it out to these tenants, and the tenants are supposed to be giving him some fruit of the vineyard, and he sends some servants to go see how they're doing and, and to gather fruit from this vineyard. And... You could just see the wheels turning of these tenants. We don't, we don't want to listen to these prophets, and that's who they are, these servants coming to the tenants. We don't want to listen to them. We don't want to give God what's already His. So what do they do with the tenants? Or what do they do with the servants, rather? They kill them. They kill the prophets. So the master of the house decides, okay, I'm going to send somebody they won't kill. I'm going to send my son. But the opposite happens. The tenants start saying, okay, well, if this is the son now, we could own our vineyard. And we wouldn't have to subject our will to anybody but ours. We could be the owner of this. The inheritance could be ours. And so they kill the son. And Jesus asked them the question, what do you think the master of the house is going to do with these tenants? And listen to the response of the Pharisees. They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and out of the vineyard and let out of the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits of their seasons. They're condemning their own selves because the, the parable is about the Jews. God sending the prophets to the Jews and them killing the Jews and then ultimately killing Jesus. And so they get it. Yeah, God's going to put these miserable wretches to death. And Jesus says, you guys didn't need this parable. What you needed was Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is exactly the parable of the tenants. Have you never read the scriptures? Didn't you guys pick up the book? The stone that the builders rejected, this has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. That's the parable of the tenants. The one that was rejected, and now listen to this. This is what I want you to hone in on. Verse 43. This is what's unique to Matthew. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. You want to be in the kingdom? What you got to do is submit your will. You got to be willing to give God what's His. So I'm going to take the kingdom, which you could have been a part of, which you could have been blessed through, and I'm going to give it to people who will give me what I deserve. Give me the fruits of the kingdom. And I ask you tonight, are you stumbling over Jesus? Are you not obeying Him? Will you not give God what is His? But brethren, remember where we started. If Jesus is a stumbling stone, if He's the rock of offense, and we preach what He preached, we preach what Jesus is demanding, that unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins, that He wants your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength, He's not asking for casual obedience. He's asking for changed lives and changed hearts. If we preach that, we're going to get in trouble, aren't we? But that's okay. Let's embrace offending. Well, you know what I'm saying. We, we don't have to be glad about it. 
but we can embrace it from the standpoint of I'm just going to tell the truth and wherever it lands, it lands. Just on a personal note, please get out your songbooks if you haven't already. But just on a personal note, I, I'm still working on this. One of the things in my younger years of preaching, you know, 19, 20, 21, I wanted to preach lessons that people would just be so happy with. And that was a big struggle for me. You start running out of sermons. And I felt like it was a big jump when I finally, and like I said, I, I'm still working on it, just came, came to the thought, I'm just going to tell it like it is. And where it lands, it lands. Where has it landed? You want to change your life? You want to give your life to Christ? You want to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins? Have you been giving God the fruits in His seasons? in its seasons. And if you haven't been living faithfully and you want to make a public confession about that, please come forward. We can have one of our shepherds pray for you and you can leave here a forgiven person. But whether you come forward or not, what matters most is that you repent and that you pray God for His forgiveness. Please come. As together we stand and sing.